Life sentences for eight Bahraini opposition members. Others also imprisoned, accused of playing a part in trying to overthrow the government. The verdicts handed down just days before the Bahraini authorities start a national dialogue for reconciliation. What message does this send out and who is going to want to talk now? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. A special military court in Bahrain has convicted 21 mostly Shia activists of conspiring to overthrow the government during widespread street protests earlier this year. Eight have been handed life sentences, others terms up to 15 years. Some were sentenced in absentia. Charles Stratford has our full report. First came the protests, tens of thousands of men, women and children from all walks of life marching through the streets of Manama demanding political change and more equal rights. Then came the crackdown. Hundreds arrested, many beaten and seriously wounded by security services. A brutality that was never expected. It shocked this tiny Gulf nation and those in the media who witnessed it. But when the journalists left, many banned from returning, the trials began. The verdicts are now being handed down. 21 opposition figures and rights activists sentenced, six in absentia. The eight given life sentences include Hassan Moshema, leader of Haq Party, his colleague Abdul Jalil El Senges, Abdul Wahab Hussein, leader of Al Wafa. Both parties had called for the Bahraini monarchy to go. Also getting a life term is rights activist Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja. His family say he has been repeatedly tortured in jail. The U.S. president recently said there can be no reform in Bahrain if the political opposition are locked up. Only last week, Washington put its major ally and home to the U.S. Fifth Fleet on the same human rights violators lists as Syria and Iran. Following the sentences, a State Department spokesman said, We are concerned about the severity of the sentences handed down in Bahrain. We're also concerned about the use of military courts to try these civilians. We continue to urge the Bahraini government to abide by its commitment to transparent judicial proceedings. The Bahraini government has called for a period of national dialogue and reconciliation starting July the 1st. The largest opposition party, Al Wafaq, says any such talk now is totally unrealistic. Protesters braved the security forces once again after the sentences were handed down. Police raids, intimidation and arrests continue more than three months after the attempt to silence Bahrainis wanting political change began. Charles Stratford, Al Jazeera. So clearly these sentences have brought once again anger onto the streets of Bahrain. To look more at the ramifications here, we're joined by our guests in London. Said al-Shihabi, member of the Bahrain Freedom Movement, who on Wednesday was sentenced in absentia to life in prison in Bahrain. In Washington, D.C., we have Joe Stork, Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch Middle East Division. He's written extensively on issues of torture within Bahrain. And on the line from Manama, Dr. Saadi Mohammed Abdallah, former member of the Bahraini Parliament. Thank you all, gentlemen, for being with us today. First of all, I want to take a look at these trials and their sentences. Saeed al-Shihabi, I'll start with you. What do you know about the proceedings in your case, and did you ever expect it to be handed a life sentence? Well, I was never uh, notified of any uh, proceeding against myself. Nobody uh, told me that there was go I was going to be tried. Uh, no uh, someone was uh, ever held for me. Uh, of course, they would say, because you are living outside, fine. But uh, when they wanted me to talk to them, they were able to, to, to contact me. And when they wanted to burn my house two years ago, they knew where, where it was, and they did. When they wanted to, to, to beat up and to, uh, to attack uh, Ali Mushema and uh, Abbas al-Umran, they knew where they were. 
So uh, there is no problem with contacting it as if they wanted to, but they didn't. So I was not aware uh, about any proceedings, of course, and I was not expected, expecting to get such a harsh sentence because we did not commit any crime. The crimes were committed by the regime. We only, we, yes, we did um, participate in demonstrations. We did call for uh, a government change. We did call for uh, reforms, but we never uh, acted upon uh, making any uh, violent violence in, of any sort. So the, the sentence has been harsh and unjustified, especially that it came from a military court under Saudi occupation. Okay, Dr. Saadi Mohammed Abdullah, how do you answer that? Why was Saeed Al Shihabi handed a life sentence? Well, first of all, I just want you to understand that Bahrain is a kingdom of institution and laws. Bahrain is not a jungle. Bahrain has laws, and one of the laws is penal code. Anybody who breaks up this law has to be punished according to his crime. Now, during what they call a revolution, or what they call is a peaceful revolution, this was completely unpeaceful, and it is not a revolution. This is a Syrian revolution, if it is right to say that it was a revolution. Many people think they, they committed many, many crimes. They killed many people, especially from the, from the Asians there. They occupied the main hospital in Bahrain, and the, they took hostages there. They kept weapons there. They uh, destroyed the university. They blocked all the main streets and the roads. They occupied the main ministries. They harmed the people. They spread the terror in Bahrain, and yet he is saying that we did not commit any crime. OK, I'll just cut in there because plenty of allegations, which it's only fair to pass back to Saeed Al-Shahabi to answer. Well, uh, I don't think I have to answer that because the, the international community had already answered that. You just look at the media, at the, at the human rights bodies to, to, to say who was uh, at fault, who, who committed the crimes who killed uh, at least four people under torture, uh, Karim Fakhrawi, Hassan Jassim Makki, uh, Zakaria Al-Ashiri, and others, who had killed more than 32 uh, Bahrainis uh, by swords or by uh, live bullets. And all their images are available. All of them, uh, their, their images are available. So we have to be told who had killed these people, who have destroyed the mosques of the Bahrainis, uh, who had brought the uh, Saudis into the country and ceded or conceded the sovereignty of the land to a foreign power. So uh, we have to answer. I think the international community, I think, is is the united in uh, in confirming what I have just said. I think uh, our friend in Bahrain is just uh, repeating the, what we have heard from the uh, mouthpieces of the regime. OK. Uh, Joe Stork, two clearly very opposing views presented there. What do you make of the way these trials were carried out? Well, the first point to make is that the trials uh, are military trials. They're a special military court. Uh, the judges, uh, the, the top judge, the top, th uh, the presiding judge is a military man, an officer. Uh, all the judges, him and the uh, two civilian judges, are appointed by the commander of the Bahrain Defense Forces. It, the, the setting is in the mil in, in the BDF uh, area, the Bahrain Defense Forces area, the courtroom. Uh, so, uh, in, 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 in all respects, it's a military court. Uh, you, the, your, our, our guest from Bahrain is correct that Bahrain does have many laws. Many of them are very good laws, but these laws were completely ignored in the conduct of these trials. The, the gentlemen who were sentenced, the 14 who were present and sentenced uh, yesterday, uh, were picked up in many cases in the middle of the night by masked uh, security people without uniforms, masked. They were taken to unknown locations where they were held for weeks, in some cases months. Their families did not know where they were. They had no access to lawyers. Uh, these are in complete violation of Bahraini laws, uh, not to mention international standards. So I'm afraid whatever crimes uh, protesters or 
non-government people, uh, ordinary Bahrainis, may have committed in the course of the demonstrations or afterwards. Uh, if there were crimes committed, they should be investigated, they should be prosecuted, but they should be prosecuted before a court that meets fair trial standards. Uh, Dr. Saidi Mohammed Abdullah, it is true, isn't it, that these are civilians who've been tried in a military court under special conditions of an emergency law? No, because yes, because we were in the emergency law, and you cannot imply the civilian laws during the pure civilian law when you have emergency laws. First of all, I have to clarify that all those people, they had a fair trial. All the guarantees that had, had been provided for them, they had their, their lawyer, they had their families this with them. This is simply untrue. All the I'm NGOs sorry. This were simply, there. Even the, even this is the, simply even not the, true. Even, no, this is a true. And this is true. This and is not true. I have some of our, this is a true. Some of my friends, they were attending there. And people representing the human rights were there. People from the... They were not there. The, I'm uh, sorry. There was no were, one from the no, human, no, they, international they, human rights community there. There, there was one, no one there. There were... There were people from the National Commission. We have, we have, we have... Yeah, a, appointed a, by the government. Have, people appointed by the government. People appointed. This, uh, this is the National Commission for the Human Rights yeah. of Bahrain. And there's the official. Abdullah Dirazi. Is, no, 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 Abdullah Dirazi, he attended once there. He's not representing the official one. He's not representing the official one. He is representing the... A human rights and it is a civilian one it does not have to do with it it's not representing the official one the well, well, tell me is abdullah is abdullah darazi able to talk publicly about what he saw in the courtroom is yeah, he able he to talk, talk with us i don't think so yeah, he, he can't talk no 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 don't assume things that you uh, instead of him he can talk freely and i we don't like anybody to fabricate to fabricate the the pure picture about any of our country. They are saying that those people, they committed the crime. They committed the crime. They what have the crime, their lawyers. What, what the crime they, was they, committed? What the crime was committed yeah, by Hassan Mushayma or by Abdul Rahab Hussain or by Abdul Jalil Singes? What are they saying? Hassan Mushayma, first of all, he was, he, was, he was the one who wanted to overthrow the regime. He was the one. Is that a crime? Is that a crime to is that is that a crime to call for uh, a regime change? Of course, it's a crime. We have a penal code. You go and to, go to Iran, go to Iran and ask for the for the for the change of their regime. You will see that they will hang. I'm talking about. I'm, I am talking about my country. Bahrain I'm not talking Bahrain. about Iran. That's what I'm saying. I'm, to, I'm talking about. That's what I'm saying. Bahrain, Bahrain. Because we are in Bahrain, they are implementing the, all the laws and according to the uh, international standards. You people, you have been living... So you, you, so you, you, you think calling for a change uh, of government been, is a crime? No, no, no. You have, been, you have been attacking Bahrain and you have been fabricating all the facts about Bahrain. You have been telling lies... About, about the ruling Bahrain family, not the about Bahrain. And, about the ruling family, you, yes, but uh, not about Bahrain. OK, Dr. Saheedi no, Mohammed Abdullah, I want to just step in here because there is one very interesting case in particular of Ibrahim Sharif, a secular uh, leftist Sunni, uh, who was also sentenced to five years in prison. Now, he led a registered political party, the Wa'ad opposition group. What, in your eyes, did he do wrong? First of all, see, there is, there is an... Uh, you know, when you want to make like riot or demonstration, you have to take a permission from the, you know, from the authority. And that is unpermitted, unpermitted demonstration against, but he did not. I'm, I'm not the judge there. I'm not the judge there, but he always said, I am not asking to throw, overthrow the regime. We okay. only want... We need to, need to move on a little bit here because we want to look forward towards the issue of this national dialogue uh, that's supposed to bring about uh, reconciliation within Bahrain. I do have to oppose again to you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Saidi Mohammed Abdullah, the question that if you are uh, sentencing op members of the opposition to trial, how do you expect people to come forward in the atmosphere of reconciliation? First of all, I just want to clarify 
when you are saying people, we, I'm talking about the, those people, they don't represent the Bahraini people. They are represent few people in Bahrain. And I can, I can ensure you this. If we are talking about the Sunnis in Bahrain, they are representing 50%. It's not according what they are saying that they are presenting the majority. They are not the majority as Shias. Bahrain is divided into Sunnis and Shias, and 50 of the population, 50% of the population, are Sunnis. It is only who is talking Sunnis about Shia Sunni. Now. We do not talk about I, Shia I, Sunni. No, wait, wait, wait. Yes, let me let me let me finish. First of all, when we are talking about the people, people of Bahrain, more than 80% of people of Bahrain are going to the dialogue. Even the opposition societies, most of them now, most of them, even those who were like with an ally with the UFAQ, now they apologize. Why? Which is the strongest ally for Al for Al UFAQ? They apologize for what they did, and they are joining the dialogue in the first of next next month. Uh, Joe Stork, now, Joe Stork, can I just uh, bring you into here? Because when you look at Bahrain, do you see that it is a country ready for national dialogue? Are the conditions right at this moment? Uh, the short answer to that is no. Let me just make one point about the legality or illegality of the demonstrations. Uh, there is a law, indeed, as your guest said, that requires one to get permission before holding a public rally or demonstration. However, uh, he should go back and take a look at the many uh, statements the Crown Prince made uh, during that time between mid-February and mid-March, where it's clearly uh, spoke from a very high official, the Crown Prince himself, which was basically saying these demonstrations are okay. These are uh, these are these are, are not illegal. So we're we're seeing we're looking at a post facto uh, sort of uh, accusing people of violating a law when at the time when there were tens of thousands of people on the street every day uh, and there was no sense that the law was being broken. This was completely irrelevant. As to the dialogue, okay. I'd also note the, the Crown Prince put on the table uh, in uh, just before the crackdown uh, a seven-point program. Uh, this would be the basis, in, in my view, uh, for, indeed, a real dialogue. But I'd note that the Crown Prince, who's been advocating for a, a dialogue, re restarting the dialogue, uh, is not is no longer in charge of that operation. It's been handed over to the Speaker of the Parliament, who's uh, well known. His record is very his public record is very clear in terms of supporting uh, the martial law crackdown. So I don't and and it seems that he's going to be sending out invitations to uh, 300 different societies, uh, not just the political societies, and certainly not just the opposition political societies. Which, if you're going to have a real dialogue. Who are you going to talk to? You have to talk with the opposition. Well, quite. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. D D Dr. Mohammed may wish that these people didn't represent many Bahrainis, but, you know, whether you like it or not, they do. And so Sa these are the people you should sit down well, with. Uh, Said al-Shihabi, uh, just who is going to be talking in a week's time at this dialogue? Well, unfortunately, uh, it is not uh, a dialogue between the opposition, the Bahraini people, and the ruling family. And this is, if there was going to be a meaningful dialogue, then the whole problem is be, uh, with the uh, Al Khalifa, not with the people. Not, there's no problem between the Shias and the Sunnis or between any factors or any ideological, uh, any ideologic, I mean, ideologically diverse uh, bodies. The problem is between the people of Bahrain and the ruling family. Now, if, if there is going to be a solution, then the ruling family must come forward and talk to the people. But, it, but when, once they have delegated that dialogue to be uh, headed and led by uh, Khalifa Dahrani, who is the head of the uh, Shura Council, uh, half of whose members are elected, then it, it has completely missed the point. The, 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 the point is not for the Bahrainis to talk to themselves. They are already talking to themselves. And if there are any barriers among them, then these barriers have been created by the ruling family. So the, the, unless the ruling family comes down to the level of the people and say, yes, what do you want from us? What do you, want, what do you expect from you? Then without this, you are not going to have a dialogue. You, only, uh, you are only going to have a, a public uh, conference or meeting in which everybody will just talk about anything.
Dr. Abdullah, it has been suggested that the Bahraini government may offer an amnesty to some of these people who have been put on trial and sentenced uh, to create the yeah. conditions for a dialogue. Can you expand on whether or not that will, will indeed take place? No, I don't think the amnesty will be there. Just Can I answer just a few things which uh, uh, Mr. Shahadi said, please? First of all, he said the problem is between the the royal family and the and the, the citizens. This is completely untrue. There is no problem between the citizens and the royal family. Most of the citizens, they respect and they believe in their royal family. And uh, they support them, a full support. Only few people, few people of the Bahrain citizen, which he is one of them, they, are, they have problem with the royal family. And the royal family will be staying. This royal family, hopefully, inshallah, it will never change. And so he is not allowed to talk about the Bahraini citizens. He can talk about himself. This is one thing. The second thing, I want to emphasize that the crown prince, the crown prince, in the beginning of the, of the revolution, as they call revolution, he called them many, many, many times to sit on the table for the dialogue. And he told them we have no ceiling for the, for the dialogue. They were refusing all the time. And they were put in many unbelievable conditions. And when, all the, when the revolution failed, now they are asking the crown prince to take over again and take the lead in this dialogue. Now, let me tell you, there is no problem who is leading that dialogue. They can attend and offer whatever they want to offer with no ceiling. As the king said, as the crown prince said, as the, the, the speaker of the, of the parliament said, everybody can come and they can offer their requirements uh, with, with no ceiling at all. Just but they are refusing. My point, my point, I think they will attend by the end of the day, they will attend the dialogue. They might create some problems inside on the table, but, but by the end of the day, they will attend. Okay, Jay Stort, from, uh, from looking outwards in Bahrain, do you think that these people are likely to attend the dialogue? Well, that's really a decision they have to make, and I don't really have any advice for them on that count. I just point out that, you know, there may be a place indeed for the kind of large public meeting uh, that Dr. Abdullah is referring to, that the Speaker of the Parliament has referred to as sort of his, his goal, his vision for this dialogue is a, a meeting where, you know, basically everybody comes and talks. That, you know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but it doesn't represent the kind of political discussion. It's not going to be the setting for the kind of political discussion between people of differing oppo uh, opposing political views. And that's the discussion that has to happen. And I don't, I don't see it happening in the way Way that uh, Mr. Dahrani uh, has outlined. I, 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 I wish it were otherwise. Uh, and I also think it's also important to note that the this kind of narrative that Dr. Abdullah just gave about what happened in March and in February, uh, I, I have a lot of problems with that narrative. Uh, if we had a, a longer time, we, we could discuss it. But the Crown Prince's dialogue proposal was not out there for a month. It was out there for a few days. Okay. Uh, Indeed, in if we did have longer, we'd go into crackdown. that. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, and we do have to look a little bit more towards the future instead. And uh, Saeed al-Shihabi, I just uh, want to ask you what future you feel there is for national reconciliation in Bahrain. I think, first of all, the, the revolution will continue. It's still there. It hasn't been defeated. Of course, we, have, we are living under uh, military rule and under uh, Saudi occupation. That's true. But the people, as we have seen yesterday and today, hopefully, and we will, uh, we will still continue, we will continue to see them marching the streets, demanding uh, serious reforms, uh, a change of regime, a change of regime meaning uh, writing a new constitution for the country uh, and, and uh, written by the people for the people, not imposed on them by the ruling family. There is no problem unless uh, the agents of the regime want to create it among the people of Bahrain. 
uh, the, the problem is and will remain between the people of Bahrain and the ruling family. This is the whole political system. I think the situation will remain uh, very tense. And I think uh, unless uh, really uh, the, the, the wrongs that have been taken, uh, that have taken place, uh, be corrected, including uh, uh, addressing the basic human rights violations, pursuing the, the torturers who killed the, our people, the, and also uh, bringing to account the ruler and his family who have uh, issued uh, the orders to shoot at the people in the same way as Mubarak has done and Bin Ali have done, unless these issues are really addressed and unless the Saudi occupation ends, ends in the next uh, few weeks or a few months, I don't think there is going to be any room for reconciliation because you cannot reconcile under the threat and under the power of the gun. Okay, well, certainly all eyes will be on July 1st in a week's time to see just how that national dialogue will play out. For the moment, though, I'm afraid we have run out of time. But thanks very much to our guests for joining us today Said Al Shihabi, Joe Stork, and Dr. Saidi Mohammed Abdullah. And thank you for watching this edition of Inside Story. Do get involved. Send any of your comments and suggestions to insidestory at aljazeera.net. Bye for now.